All right. So uh, thank you very much for uh, the introduction, Amanda, and thank you very much for having me. Um, so let me introduce myself. I'm Clark Shane. I'm the head of product at a company called Kepler, and I'll tell you a bit more about it in a minute. Uh, I've been contacted, I think it was a bit less than a month ago, uh, by Amanda uh, and, uh, and someone else to see if uh, I would join you to uh, share some of my experience uh, as a B2B product manager. And so uh, to start uh, the talk, I'd like just to, uh, to tell you a couple of things about me. Um, I'm 34 years old. I'm actually not product manager by background because there is no actually diploma for product management. I think you, you all agree there that you've never started your career as a product manager. I started my career as a geologist. So I, I am one of those who uh, studied geology, go figure, right? But it's actually quite uh, an interesting topic because it teaches you a lot of the creativity and, and uh, the, the visualization that uh, you need to have in your head of what's happening underground. And I started then um, my career like this. So you see my screen and I'm gonna do something I've never done before, which is I'm gonna build a story with you guys. And I'd like, like it to be very interactive. So please don't hesitate to shout and mute. Um, I, I'll just put a, a comment there. And then we'll build a story and I'll, I'll tell you more about my, some of my chronicles and, and then events that happened that led me to, to learn things about product management. So, um, the first things uh, I, I like to tell you is more about just, okay, how did I came to be where I am today? Right? So in two, back in 2010, uh, I started in a company called Schlumberger, right? So we often call it uh, SLB. And in SLB, I started at the bottom of the chain. I was a geologist and actually what I was doing was very simple. I was doing what we call, what we used to call back then, support. So I was answering the phone, training people into how to use software and basically guiding them through the process of support. Today, this part of this job is um, in under the customer success type of, uh, of roles, only part of it. I didn't do account management to it and so forth. It evolved over the last decade, but I was doing mostly support training and consulting. Like that. After a while, I uh, moved to do uh, something a bit different, but quite linked uh, around the sales. I was what we used to call a technical sales and what today we call a product specialist. So I was basically taking, um, taking basically the path of understanding the cycle of the product, right? How the product is built and, and, and so forth. And actually that uh, reminds me that when you think about it, you know, when you look at the uh, life cycle of a product from, let's say, here is the ideation, I, then you have the creation and design, you know, CD, then you have the development, then you have the deployment, then you have the marketing, then you have the sales, and then you have the support. And then actually it goes all the way back and so forth, right? So my career, actually, I started there and I went backward. And it was one of my biggest learning because after sales, what did I do? Well, guess I did marketing and I did marketing for a while for various products uh, at a global scale in Schlumberger. So most people don't know about Schlumberger and I'm pretty sure you don't know about Schlumberger, but I can tell you it's a, it's a company that without it, um, you wouldn't actually be able to put gasoil in your car or uh, gas in your uh, in your oven and so forth, because it's the leading uh, company is the leading company for oil oil and gas services and hydrocarbon services basically. And they had a department and they have still a big digital department, which is the software department. And I was basically part of this department. So, and that's often what happens in B two B. You are part of this world of what I call the shadows. No one knows what you do. Your own mother won't understand what you do, right? When you try to explain them, you know, generally your friends say, what again? And I'm pretty sure we all had this experience where you people don't actually know that, okay, B2B exists in certain part of the, like certain part of the world of the business exists, right? 
And, and that's something I've learned very early on. Uh, stop trying to explain to people what I do. Uh, just tell them I'm walking into a, uh, an environment and, and into a division of work that is technology and I'm helping building technology. Like that, this is simple. Then after marketing, I realized that I wanted to go even further down the line because I was getting frustrated that the things I wanted to be done in the product were not done and things like that. And, you know, in a large corporation, uh, basically what happens when you complain a lot, they end up giving you the job. So <laughs> they gave me the job of a product manager and then of head of product where I was leading um, all the product for uh, Surface. So basically I was managing uh, all the product that allow oil and gas company to find, to search, find an oil and gas in the subsurface. So there is a lot of softwares, there is a lot of users, uh, and it makes hell a lot of money, all right? Just to give you an order of magnitude, I was by that time, uh, I spent 10 years in, uh, in Schlumberger, right? And by the end of my 10 years, I was managing roughly 30 to 32, depends on the time. I started at 17 and then 30, I finished at 32 product managers and uh, trainers and business developers that were part of the team. Uh, not all in direct report, I had multiple levels. And then um, we were basically leading a, a team of uh, 150 to 200 developers, uh, depending also on the years. So you could imagine that's quite big. Uh, that's a equivalent of half, more than half a billion dollar in revenue every year recurring. Uh, that's more than 50, 55,000 users. Uh, for B2C customer uh, world product managers, oh, that's nothing. That's not too much users. But the impact of the work you do on those users have impacts of millions, sometimes billions of dollars impact. Um, so that's basically what I've done in, in Schlumberger. And I've learned across these years uh, that actually product management and managing the product is not only about you know the day-to-day -day agile methodology and, and just the project type of management. It's, it has to have a business component. It has to have a design component and a technology understanding and so forth, right? Then a year ago, I basically moved. I, I decided that, you know, there's things that I've learned in Schlumberger that it's, I've been very grateful, right? Um, because it teaches you the ways to work. Now, when you have so much money, so many resources, you don't learn how to develop a product in the most linear fa fashion. And you are also generally very slow. So one thing I've decided back then is, first of all, we don't want to stay in oil and gas per se. Second of all, I wanted to learn, take what my learnings and apply it into a smaller company, a startup that is moving to scale up. So to see how I can learn to be more lean and uh, more thoughtful as well into how to produce, how to basically develop a product and, and, and grow it. Because I touch this and I'm gonna touch that there into product that had various ages. And that's a critical thing that we never talk about enough. You do not manage a product that is 30 years old the same way you manage a product that is five years old. And that's basically the core of, of my learnings and that I'm gonna share with you today. So I joined a company called Kepler. Uh, it's a wonderful company because um, uh, what the company does is also extremely important, but no one knows about. We track commodities uh, around the world so to facilitate the global trades, uh, so to, to, to help traders and financial uh, players and, and companies that are basically trading those commodities to have more uh, uh, sustainable and, and, and efficient way of, of, uh, of trading. So we track all of that live, real time, 24-7. Uh, and from 30 people managing, I'm down to a bit less than 10 amazing people. Actually, some of them are also connected today. Hi there. Um, and in here, what do I do? I manage the product team, right? And basically guide them uh, as much as possible and empower them to do uh, uh, the work. I lead the design of uh, the company. So that basically goes with uh, the branding of the company, the interface, the user experience. It's actually not just designed in the sense of 
uh, how it looks, it's how it feels, how people experience it. And then I also lead the marketing efforts uh, of the company. We are a company of uh, 140 uh, people across the world. Uh, some are actually based in Singapore and in Dubai and Paris and in London and in Houston and New York. I mean, it's everywhere. Right? And uh, in here, I'll, I'm learning more how to be lean and so forth. In parallel of that, a couple of years ago, I've started as well to, uh, to basically um, help uh, product managers around the world. And I basically mentor product managers uh, as part of a group that I joined um, a year ago almost called the French CPOs. Um, so uh, this group is the group of uh, the, the, the top chief product officers in, in the French are take it's a small network but uh, we do a lot of help to coach other product managers help them grow um, so forth and I'm also part of other groups for um, uh, basically startup like Techstars that allow uh, allow me to mentor startup and basically learn with them what it takes to build product and and so forth so in that sense um, I've had the chance and I'm very lucky. And uh, I've had the chance to touch uh, basically at many different things in the product life cycle as a job, right? But more importantly, I've seen product of various age and various maturity. And this is probably the biggest learning that I'm gonna share with you today in, my, in, in those chronicles, because I'm gonna tell you a story for each period of life of product uh, and, and basically make sure that um, you, you see a bit of my learnings, some of my mistakes, and uh, also some of, of, of the things I've, I've successfully done um, because I was uh, guided by very smart people around me who knew about product management, but who knew also about business. Because let's not, fa let's not forget it, B2B is business to business. So you are selling to a different kind of users. You are selling generally and you're building a product to be sold to a smaller uh, amount of people, you know, a smaller community, which means that you need to be very much more aware of what they do and you, are, you need to be able to talk to them because you do not have necessarily always the data to back it up and so forth. But before going into that, um, I would like to, just to reflect on a couple of things, right? So uh, if I take what I basically explained, and I uh, redrew basically uh, the, uh, the, key, uh, the key pillars of uh, what I've learned over my career, which is design, tech, and uh, business, basically, uh, which is also actually something that the Mind the Product created back in 2010, 11, uh, back then. It's this very diagram that every say uh, knows. Everybody thinks and says that the pro a good product manager is in the middle. And that's wrong. <laughs> I'm going to be straight there. The reality is that you are never in the middle. It's very rare. And one of the things I've learned is that actually, based on your experience, you generally tend to be into one of those sections. So part of my experience was that I've learned that my biggest strength is actually in this area, which is in between design and uh, product. And sometimes, and I say sometimes, uh, I'm actually having to switch with uh, this side of the, uh, the vein diagram, which is the tech and uh, the business. Now, why do I say, uh, why do I say that? Is because actually very often people think that they need to try to master three, the three of them. Well, what I'm going to show you with my experience there is that actually you don't need to. You need to adapt your uh, skills based on to the product and the, 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 the time of the product, uh, the time of development, the age of the product, the maturity of the product you are in, right? So let's move this a minute and park it here, right? And I'm going to use that and draw you a timeline of let's say the age of a product, the maturity of a product. 
So let's start first by giving you an order of magnitude, right? So we have the product that is zero year, five year, 10 year, 15, 20, and then 25 plus, okay? Um, basically, those are the years. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you in the journey of this and I'm gonna put back the focus level that each product at each stage of its maturity needs based on to everything I've seen in all the product, either I manage or I've seen people building over the years, right? Either it's a design, it's a focus on design or technology and this, uh, or in business, right? So let's draw the timeline. So this is the timeline, right? Sorry, it's not perfectly straight, I'm trying my best. <laughs> so uh, let's start with, actually, I'm not gonna start from the beginning. I'm gonna start from the end because my story started not by, by managing a product that was very young and to the infancy. I was in a large corporation in Schlumberger and I was managing the two, I was managing two of the biggest products uh, of Schlumberger in software. One of them was 30 years old and the second one, when I started to manage it, was 15 years old. Right? So I basically started my journey somewhere here and somewhere here. Right? Now, what did I learn in that part of the world, in that part of the timeline of a product? First of all, let's talk about the, the, the 30 years old product. In business to business, it's very often that you have those kind of products. They are old. They are... Uh, quite clunky, not clunky, they are solid, they are robust. Most, most of the time people say, oh, I hate using it. Oh, I don't want to use it. You know, those are the product that everybody hates, but they end up using it anyway because they have no other choice. Why? Because those products are extremely well integrated. Those products have got the maturity and have it, its richness. And generally what happened, large corporations are gonna to tend to take those integrated product even if they are not that great. An example, the product I had was called Geoframe and Petrel. Petrel was 15 years old and Geoframe was 30 years old. Geoframe was the dad of Petrel on its base, concept base, right? But then um, when I talked to the sales guys, they were using C4C or Salesforce and all the people who use ETRM knows, for example, that those tools are not very much like, but they are useful because they are matured. And in this case, what did I learn? I've learned that when you have a discussion with the customer, right, you are actually uh, in the place where the most important is not the features anymore, is not the technology anymore. When you are reaching 20 years old, it's the business. You have a business discussion with your, with your customer, right? And in this case, um, if we say that this is just like level of interest, okay? Uh, if I draw the, the, the piece for a product, I'm gonna just do something a bit clear here. I'm gonna put it even longer. So when you're on the, 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 the end phase, basically you are sunsetting the product, right? So you are basically focusing more onto uh, the business side of thing uh, at that level, business is blue, right? Um, design is pink, is is uh, is green, and in here you, you can't do much about the design. You've done quite a bit, and you can just improve, but you you really you have really stop working on the design. The technology is a bit different because you are basically having a product that is so mature that you need to start to migrate your users from one solution to another because the technology are improving so fast that basically keeping the product um, uh, sustained is becoming more and more costly, All right? So what did I learn there? I learned that I had to be what I call the politician. Basically, every customer that was to come to me for one of those products and asking me for features or things, I was basically telling them no. So this is where you learn to say no. And I'm gonna tell you this anecdote. We used to have those steering committees for one of those products where 
you had 15 customers from one company that were spending more than $10 million uh, every year. And they were coming with a list of 500 features every year. And they were counting the amount of features you would deliver for them. Because obviously, they, they, they spend $20 million with, with you. They want, they want return. And my team and I were sitting there. And to almost every single one of them, I told them no, straight in the face. First learning, never do that. <laughs> Because when you tell them no, and you don't tell them why, it pisses them off. But that was back in 2016, 17. Trust me, I was 30 years old. Um, you learned the lesson. So you learn to know how to say no and explain them why. And this is why being able to explain the technology is quite important, right? Because you are going to have to tell them like to do what you want, right? You need to invest a lot of technology, but actually the return is not going to be great, right? So to do that, uh, basically discussion, I've learned something. So this part, right, I'm going to draw a line here and I'm going to, I'm going to call it um, the, basically the, the, the sunsetting or politician part, right? And what happened is that you, you basically work, um, you, you basically work in, into a very simple manner. What, what I've learned there is I basically had to be very transparent to my customer. So one of my learning here is that I've basically taken uh, a very simple approach of showing them a very simple chart where I was explaining them that this is the return, right? And this is uh, the investment right, or the complexity, if you prefer. And you have a line there. That's the first thing, by the way, I taught my team when I came in Kepler, is this uh, vision, where you say, well, if I want a certain feature or a certain workflow, well, does the user really need it? Well, you, you say, okay, the impact is that high and the, 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 the complexity is not that, that big, right? So maybe do it. And then, Maybe one of them is actually, okay, impact is high, but complexity is very high. Right? So what you learn in that case, you learn that when you, when you do that with your customer right, and your users, they start to understand that actually the value, the things you need to avoid, there is certain zone you need to avoid. You need to avoid this zone, right? So this zone is the no-go zone. Why? Because it's extremely complex and very little return. And when you have a product that is 20 years old, you generally know that's going to be where you are, right? Because the cost of putting something or changing something is very high when the architecture is very high. You, when you go further down the line of, uh, of the age, you'll see that actually you are more in, in that science that is more the organic growth of your product, okay? And then younger you are, younger you seek a product that basically are more in that sense. So your product will basically do something like this. It's gonna start like this, then go, then expand in each direction, and then go back up. And that's 20 years old, right? That's 20 years old of product. So in this case, what do you need? You need to have an extremely high business sense, right? So if I were to put um, uh, in that chart where as a product manager, my, the product managers I were, I were managing were had as a skills. They were mostly skills into that zone of business, right? And some were more technical because they, they needed to, uh, to do something, but it's mostly this one, right? So that's at 20 years uh, there, okay? So 20, 30 years, you, you basically, um, actually you, I can even put them there. So that's uh, even 15 years, right? So depending on onto the edge of the product, you are not going to have to use the same skills. So there's no point trying to be in the middle when they don't need you in the middle. The product doesn't need you in the middle. Right? Now what happened? Right? So I'm back. I'm back uh, there. I'm managing a product that is 15 years old, uh -huh. and. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm managing a product that is 15 years old, and basically you. Um, you have different challenges. So what happened then is you have a very large amount of users, right? 
And those amount of users, basically, they, um, they've been using the product for the same, the same way, the same, like for a long time. So what needs to happen there is a change of experience because experience is change. You've seen it. If I take, for example, Microsoft, right? Microsoft did it very well with Office. They started in the 70s, 80s, you know, with uh, Excel, actually. Uh, the concept was so good that the concept still remains today and is actually used as well. But they've changed the experience of the product world and, and, and Excel and the rest using the ribbon at some point in the 2000s, uh, yes, 2000s, changing to visual graphics. So here the focus is a bit different. The focus is more on, on, uh, um, on design where basically um, arriving that stage, basically you'll have big push on design Right, smaller push on the uh, the technology, but actually, what often happens is at the same time you do that, you have a dent here, and then you also have a roughly stable, a bit less on the business. Why? Because this is where you start to have a very rich product, where you have a lot of features, right? and you need to think of how you package it differently. So that phase, I call um, the mutation, basically. So if I were draw, uh, sorry, if I if if I were to draw uh, this line again, right? Uh, this phase. So this is the politician, and this is the mutation. So what did I learn there? I learned that uh, basically, when you look at the history of a product. Right. And you say that this is 100% of your usage. Right. When you look at the history of a product, and I'm going to draw it very simply, um, you have basically, when you start the product and it's zero year old up to that, that, that time, um, the usage generally, the amount of usage of your platform, because you have an amount of features that grows, so this is the number of features. The adoption of our product will look like this. And you are gonna end up having just 5% of the product that is actually used. Richer is your product, less likely you have users to actually have more diversified users and less likely you have actually the amount of users to know your product as a whole and the rest. So what did I learn? I learned that in this case, you can either, and I'll do it in green, in this case, in green, you can either, if you are there or there, say, I'm gonna change the experience and I'm gonna reboost my usage, right? Or you can also say, I'm gonna completely change my product and start a new product. So take some of those concepts, migrate them and start a new product right, with uh, the same amount of users, but in parallel, okay? So in this case, what there, there is no best practice. You need to see how the market reacts, what the market needs and so forth. And this is why you need some sense of business because design and, and redesigning the experience is one thing. Thinking about the packaging of your product is something else. And this is why I say, you know, you need to, to play around all your skills and strengths. So if I were to come back to here, 15 years old, we are here, right? So um, going backward, right? I have, uh, I'm going that way, so design, right? And sometimes I go that way like that as well. So I'm in this area here and that's 10 years, uh, 10 years in general, okay? Did you see, I still didn't touch uh, the middle here. I still didn't arrive there. I've, I've turned around, I focused, and I had to learn to focus my attention into other skills and acquire other skills of discussion with customers, of packaging, of sales, of marketing, to actually achieve the growth of the product. Now, this kind of product exists everywhere. Those products are the product that have the best concepts. One thing I've also learned uh, 
starting my career by managing old product is that when you're in this mutation phase and you're trying to convince your customer to use the product differently, if you are trying to change the feature or the experience, it might be fine. But if you try to change uh, the principle of the product, a concept, right, it's a bit, a bit more challenging. One thing I've learned is that great product never dies. The first time I said that, I said that to my brother and he looked at me and said, I disagree. And I said to him, you disagree because you think of a product as a, uh, amount of features, but the product is beyond that. The product is based onto principles and concepts. If the concepts or principle, sometimes some also call it the distinctives, right, of the product are right, then they are never gonna die. The concept is gonna be moving from one product to another. And as much as you are actually diversifying and mutating your product, right, the concept remains. The concept I had in Schlumberger was integration and data visualization, right? Those were the two tools that we are building. We are building an integration of workflows, so of an outcome-based type of approach. And we were visualizing in a stunningly way in 3D and actually in four dimension, you know, uh, the, the subsurface, which was the most compelling for our users. Right? I often say as well, that the best product in the world are Legos. Do you know why? Because they have the simplest concept. I have a brick and I can put a brick on top of another. And by all means, when I do so, I create something and I can tell a story. The concept is the most simple. I'm putting a brick against uh, on top of each other or weirdly enough, I'm building something. Right? That's the best product in the world. The concept is right, right? And everybody tried to copy it successfully or not, right? And actually most of the houses are built like this. So it's actually not a concept that they created, but they thought, okay, actually it can unlock something. The second, the second thing I've learned there, so here I've learned that concepts, right? Or principles are the most important things of the product. There is no point having an attachment to an interface. There is no point having an attachment to um, the product itself, the features, because frankly, that's not what the product is about and why we've built the product in the first place. And that was one of my biggest learning. The second learning based on this is that the best product, so a great product never dies because of its, their concept never dies. The best product a product that tells a story. Product that allows the user to tell a story. Why? Because when they do, they are talking not about how they've done things and not how they've actually managed to develop, like to do something with the tool. They are, to they are talking about why they've made the decision and why they've made those changes. And this is the next step. And I've learned that by managing product that we are very old. And I'm very grateful because I've learned to actually um, start by the end. One of the product, uh, the product called Geoframe that was 30 years old, I had to sunset it. In Schumacher, we used to call it retirement. You know how it, how it looks? It's very simple. I have one guy doing for two years legal, uh, discussions and moving people from one platform to another. And after that, we sign off, the, the, the head of technology, uh, the, the, the CTO sign off the retirement and we remove it from our price book and support and so forth. We keep the code, it's stored and archived somewhere in our uh, technology team, but the, the product is not, is not existing anymore. And that's a very interesting experience to try to retire a product. Because you have to tell your users who, who seems to like the product that actually this product is not good enough anymore for them when they are very happy with it. So this is why the business side is very important. Now, let's go back even further into the edge of a product. And here I'm gonna jump actually with the experience I have currently at Kepler. My product is not 10 years old, is five years old, six years old, right? 
So I'm going to go up to um, uh, that. That uh, I'm going to do two. There is two zones that actually uh, happen that are often um, quite close. All right. So those two zones here are actually very similar in the sense that they are closing, and sometimes the two happens at the same time. The first, uh, the first one on the on the the rest is diversification. Right. So diversification, and I'm going to explain why, is a stage where any product needs to happen, right? Because you've started to reach out the max of uh, the user, and, and especially in B2B, because you are in niche product, you are starting to maybe not max out, but you are getting, you are becoming the, if you, you are very successful, you are becoming the, the standard, right? So you start to need to think of how I'm going to, improve and increase the concept or add a new concept to it, okay? And I'm gonna draw a bit the, the charts in a minute. Uh, and then this is also why a lot of the product that you see uh, that are five to 10 years old are being sold, right? Because the concept has matured enough, right? And what happened is in this case, um, the business actually is quite high, right? The tech actually is higher as well because you need to incorporate more things. And the design actually do a small bump. And then here you have a bigger part and I'm gonna draw it in a minute, right? In that case, you know, it's where you start to learn uh, to ask yourself the question of, okay, what's next? You know, a product has been successful on its base concepts and principle. Where do you take the product next? Today, at Kepler, we are in between the phase five and two. The phase five, by the way, I call it the phase of integration and expansion. And I'm gonna draw the line so you know. What happened then, oops, sorry. What happened then is that you have a bit more design because you have to basically, uh, uh, and I explained why earlier you, you don't have it so much in B2B. You have uh, quite a lot of tech, right? But a bit less. And then you have a bit less of business per se, but uh, after the, before that, it's where you, ha you start the company, right? So uh, what happened then is um, you basically need to incorporate and integrate more with the rest of the ecosystem. So let's go back to the to the merge. And I'm, I'm gonna treat them together because it's very difficult to, especially nowadays, to actually uh, uh, distinguish both. It happens so fast, the movement in between both. When you start a product in B2B, you need to be a market fit, right? So this part is the quick wins, right? Wins, sorry. So remember this chart? This is when you start the product, right? This is when you are five years old, right? So this is zero, fives, 10, 10, 15, 20, okay? So here, what am I, what am I learning today? And, and my teams are learning with me as well with those products is you have to be cautious of two things. It's parallel tracks, basically. You have to make sure that in one track, you expand and uh, basically you expand your offer based on the concept, right? So based on the concept you have been using. Right? You sustain the product and grow it, um, basically what we call, what I often call organic growth, right? But then what happens, you need to start to look also of what would happen if I do not take care of other things, especially in the tech realm, I will call it for a better word, the de technical depth that will put my product at risk. And this is what I often uh, mention as uh, the events that basically would break your expansion. And those are the at-risk uh, at development. 
what very often happens in product teams is that they are so focused on delivering features that they forgot that the developers and the technology has evolved and need updating and they have a technical debt because they went so fast. And this is where I've learned something else as well. To listen to the need of my developers. It's not actually a phase where you have to just give a list of features to your developers. It's a phase where you need to make sure that your engineers and your product managers are in sync into understanding that if we do not solve some of the technical problems that you might have, they are not really problems because the product works, but if we do not scale it, you can't scale the product and the product is gonna fail. And this is a very tricky part of the growth, right? Where it's a young product, five years is not old, uh, but it's not new anymore. It's not fancy, it's, you know, users or, or companies and, and people who are using it, it's like, okay, it's reliable. It becomes to be reliable. But if you don't do it, right, you are risking to actually lose your users. So if you look at this, right, this chart, if I don't actually um, either, uh, either do uh, basically a, a, a break, I'm gonna draw it on blue, uh, a break here and saying, okay, wait a minute here, all right? I'm gonna actually stop develop, developing features and focus onto the technical debt and the, the engineering work necessary. You won't be able then to expand later and regrow over time. You are gonna get stuck. And this is a, a very challenging place. Then you have the other part, and this is where product managers very often forget that they are not just designers or, or, or business managers. They are people who are, who needs to understand what the market needs and needs to see and evaluate the future of the market, right? Why? Because this is where you need to basically diversify and create new, uh, uh, new offering, right? And this offering, right, they can use those concepts or they can bring new concept as well. Okay, new principle. So the challenge in that place is really to be lean into your development Listen to your engineers, right? Listen to your teams to tell that tells you, wait a minute, here we are reaching a point. We have a lot of users, right? You don't want to lose them, but you want to win more. And this is the, the, the challenging part of things. Because when you start, so if I start back on the quick wins, and here actually, it was not in Kepler, I've learned it. I've learned that in Schumacher because we started new product before I left. It's a very different game. You need to search the business fit. You are focused onto a business fit, a need that is so small that what's important is the technology you're gonna use, not, rem not really the design in B2B. The design in B2B is secondary in the first couple of years of your product. You need to prove that your product works. If it's ugly, it's okay. Now, obviously there is more trend saying, no, it's not, but the reality is that if your product work in B2B is gonna sell. As simple as this, right? You have to prove it works. This is why the design is not so important, but in the integration phase, what happened is that you spend a lot of time redesigning your offering and then integrating with the rest of the ecosystem. Because if you do not integrate your offer with anyone else in the ecosystem, right? You cannot grow. And that's basically some of the learnings that I had at that stage of when you move here, you need to uh, basically uh, create the new concepts, right? Listen, right? You listen all the time, right? You often listen to the user, but what I've learned is that this time around, you need to listen to your tech team. You need to be aware of what they need because without you realizing it, what they need will actually help you in the long run grow faster. 
It's an investment that is worth having and that you are necessary to be done because you've accumulated uh, technical debt that is too, too heavy. The other things you, you, you learn here is that in the integration part and in the, the expansion part, design is important, but it's not the design of how a product look, is how you make a workflow more efficient. And let me, let me draw a bit what it means. Um, you can, so I work in a, in a world where I work with traders. Traders have a very, very short attention span and they basically want to have the, the fastest information. They want to have an information extremely fast, right? That means that basically, um, if you tell them that doing a workflow from A to B take them, uh, let's say five minutes, it's way too long. So working on the design is not working onto the, how the, the tool will look, is working into making sure you can reduce this time incrementally so it become one minute or a few seconds, right? This is also what you, what you learn. You learn that it's not actually the feature that is important, is the outcome, is understanding what is the outcome you want. So the outcome right here is B. And then in B2B is how, do I, how fast can I get B from A or from C? How can I get B basically? So this is where, when we talk and you often talk, you know, we want outcome-based roadmap and, and things like that. Most people think it's, you know, fluff. No, it's not. It's building a roadmap or building a tool based on outcome means that you are going to focus on to getting the experience. So the user's outcome is what matters. And this is what I've learned uh, in Kepler is you have to focus and you have to make very hard decisions. Why? First of all, money, you don't have it as many, as much. I don't have $20 million every year to spend in, in product development. So I have to very, very carefully with the team decide what we do. And it's not actually, frankly, in my team, it's not me anymore who actually tells them no and, and the rest. The product managers in this team, you know, actually they are uh, online, Gaspar and Shruti, actually are entitled and are responsible. It's their duty to do this very hard decision because they've analyzed what their users need as an outcome. So when, user, when very often you, you, you hear people say, I have difficulty to communicate an outcome-based roadmap to my managers and the co-founders of the company and so forth, very often, they, are, they don't focus on to the outcome for an external point of view. They focus on the outcome of the company. If you focus the outcome of your experience and your roadmap onto what the users is going to achieve and how you are going to translate it into a dollar value for you, because frankly, in B2B, it's, it's not the amount of people who are going to use it. It's the dollar value that is the most important. And right? it's how much you are going to get as money. It's... It's quite important. So if I go back here, I basically moved uh, my line to uh, moving actually from a bit more uh, tech, right here. Then at some point, somewhere here, right? Actually, you see that, um, uh, I think it's this point, it's seven years, right? You are actually back here in the middle and it's the only time it's, the only time you will be there. <laughs> Why? Because it's a balance between managing the experience of your users, managing the technical debt, and making sure that when you package your product, you do it well. And it's in the only time. Then when you move towards the early win, you actually go back to this world here, and sometimes you go back here. So actually, if I were to draw it like this, you, from the start, you do something very, um, very much like here, uh, there, 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 then there, and then you go back here. So it's a, it's a zigzag in between the, the three, the three buckets. And you always, actually your starting point is your end point in a B2B product. Right? And 
what very often people uh, rea don't realize that actually um, all of that needs to happen. So it's not, ver it's not the, the product. So you need to, when you hire and you build a team of product manager, you should not think, okay, how does this score compare to design tech and business business? No, you need to think, what does my product need? Where is it in this cycle? And then I'm going to hire and I'm going to build a team to answer this pro to answer the need of the product and not the ideal product manager. Very often I hear CPOs, head of products that are trying to find the, the unicorn that knows to do everything. The rate is that your product doesn't necessarily need that. Your product needs a specific type of product management based on to, um, the, the, the time or the maturity of the product. Now I'm going to put a caveat on this, right? So let's, let's, let's take this chart. So I'm going to take it all. There we go. I'm going to duplicate it and I'm going to just move it here, right? Mm. Let's, uh, let's smile, let's, let's laugh a bit, right? And I'm going to take away, I'm going to actually move every one of those, oops, sorry. I'm going to take away this, yes. I'm just going to move them a bit apart so I can draw you a couple of things. So zero, five, 10, 20, uh, no, 15, 20, and 25. Okay, it's 25. All right, so if I were to do that, clean a bit, okay. This chart with the timeline of that timeline that you see uh, up there, right, was very valid between, 20, uh, between 2010 and 2020, all right? What happened is that as technology grow, right? You see another effect, you see another thing happening in the world of product. This timeline is shrinking, right? The maturity of your product, basically, uh, the, the, the product comes to maturity way faster nowadays and is gonna carry on uh, growing way faster. And the lifespan of a product, and this is where I told you, you need to start to predict the future, right? Is, is gonna basically shrink. So here we are in the 2010s, right? Here we are in the 2020s. And here I can tell you, and I'm happy to come back in 10 years, right? To actually verify if my prediction is right, that actually the, the, the time to actually all of the, do all of this in a product in B2B is gonna shrink more and more. The reason is very simple. Most of the key concepts have been already built into product that, has, that are older for the B2B world, okay? Creating new concepts that are gonna spam for years and years is gonna be very, very difficult. And what people wanted then is what I call the integration, right? Now they want more and more product that does the job well for some of their key workflows, right? but connects extremely well in between them. They want interconnectivity, right? What is happening nowadays is actually more and more, and you see it mostly because you have the rise of mobility, of new technologies around um, more segmented type of things. People are wanting solutions and product that does very well something very quick, right, and move on. We call them the apps and you have them on your phone, right? And with time, you are gonna see that large corporations are gonna still invest in integration, but actually the segmentation of the product in B2B are gonna be greater and greater and they're gonna be more niche and niche. And a lot of, and what's gonna happen is that big corporations, and it's already started, are starting to, be, to buy basically those ecosystem, those ecosystem of product there and just making sure they are well connected in there. But it's not like one experience in all. It's just, it does the job well for one task. Why? Because we are becoming more and more impatient and integration is not necessarily the most important thing. Experience is starting to be a bit more important and how fast you can get the, the, the result. The pace of delivering a product, the pace of actually delivering any solution to our users are changing. And this evolution of this chart is gonna change. 
And this is why also the evolution of that is going to change. The type of product managers we need for here is going to be a bit different, right? We are going to have to have not product managers that are very good at one thing or not. We are going to have to have product managers. And you know what? I'm going to draw, um, I'm going to redraw it properly because like that, you'll, you'll see the difference. So this and this and this. So remember biz design tech, right? Rather than having product manager that are there or there, right? What they're gonna ask and what we need as a community to make sure is that our product managers are actually not aligned in the middle, right? This is not of my interest because the team needs to be there. A team of product managers needs to be there, but they always have at least one uh, the, those two type of things, right? They always have one of those, right? Which is basically more in the middle, but always sharing multiple skills. Multi-skilling is very important, right? Now, as much as I, I love my community, I can tell you when I interview product managers, they say, yeah, I'm in the middle, or I am in both the right is that they are never. They are always, especially younger they get, Right, they are always into one of those those buckets, right? And uh, the goal is to make sure that you build a team that is in the middle. This middle part is the team. And to be able to respond to this, you need to have a very strong, balanced team. One exercise exercise we've learned and we've we are doing on a regular basis now in Kepler is that all the product managers and myself included, we've we met. Right. And for a couple of hours, we actually evaluate ourselves of where we are in that chart, each individually, and then the average is the team. That help us make sure that we understand where is our weakness so to respond to the need of our product. Right. So what did I learn, right? I've learned, and I'm gonna put the learnings here. I've learned that concepts, right, are immortals. When there are great concepts, they are immortals. I've learned that um, the best product um, tell, uh, help you uh, tell a story. I've also learned that you need to you need to learn to say no, right? You need to. Um, it's it's going to be more like the the very uh, diplomatic no. Is very important. <laughs> I've learned to listen to my engineers. And finally, I've learned that I will never stop learning. And I will always, always have to adapt myself and move across the various basically part of the skills that you need, you know, and learning and questioning yourself about your capabilities is extremely important, right? And finally, but not least, I've learned that actually you do not need a product. The product needs you, so you need to fit the product needs, you know. So your skills need need to fit uh, product needs. Now, I'd like to finish by just changing the title of my talk. Those are not the chronicles of a B two B product managers. Those are the learnings. Uh, from the Chronicles of a B2B product manager. There we go. I'm done. Questions? Feedback? That, anything? That's really awesome. Thanks, Clark, for the amazing talk.
Um, I seen some question popping up from our YouTube uh, video. So I'm, I'm not call... on YouTube, but uh... in Nicola, in Nicola. So he asks, what are the key early indicators to suggest the product works and that it clearly has a market need? I ask because analytics logs we get are absolute data or information. So how would you make it relative? How do you benchmark it? So the, the difference with a B2C product in B2B is that you have to talk to your customers. You have to talk to your users because your user's base is so small that you have no other choice than to actually talk to them and to what you're going to see in the analytics, and we've had this discussion in Kepler many times, is that you're going to see a bias because you do not have a, a mass, a critical mass. You have like thousands of users and you look at the analytics and they all do the same thing, but they do, they do it the way you designed it. Right? You don't have like a million users that actually, you actually see if there is a problem. Because the, the amount of people is so small, the analytics, as you said, is, um, works, but it doesn't give you the full information because it's biased. So what you need to do is go back and, and understand, okay, what is my bias in this analytics? And it's generally the bias of the, um, either the data you are providing or the experience you are providing and so forth and talk to your users and talk to the users and as many as you, 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 you have. If, you, if as a product manager in B2B, you do not talk to a user at least once or twice a week, there is a problem. And again, once and twice a week is not enough. By the way, users don't always, uh, they are not always, the users are not always outside customers of another company. Often also in B2B, especially in large corporation, I think Amanda is the, your case in, in, uh, in Walt Disney, your users are actually Walt Disney people, correct me if I'm wrong, but they are actually um, uh, people in the same company. And so you need to talk to them. You, you basically need to ensure that you have this continuous uh, discussion. One of the things we've done in Kepler that uh, works well is that we've built the, uh, a group or user group that we call the advisory program uh, that basically uh, is a specific amount of people and uh, that knows basically well our product and use it. And uh, we have regular calls with them. And every time we have something new and, and want to try it, we benchmark it against that, right? You need to have those trusted advisors. If you don't, and you only focus on the analytics, you're never gonna get it relatively. It's not, you're not gonna get actually the right feedback. It's a very different world B2B because the amount of users you have is way smaller. And your question, any little feedback, you know? Uh, hey, Clark, to unmute uh, Sui here. I think your presentation is really fascinating. I mean. From the style, like the, uh, the presentation mode where you are just drawing on the board and it's very engaging. And also the content where you are sharing, like I think because you have different experience from your previous company as well as your current, uh, kind of like a, I call it start, startup because it's a very famous one, I actually know it. And, and also you shared the future vision of uh, from 2010 to 2020 and 2030, like how the product lifetime will shrink. So my question would be like, how do you see like for 2030 in terms of uh, building an ecosystem, how everything is interoperable. Like, what do you see? Like, is there any uh, sign from the industry, even from the consumer side, anything that you have seen or something you have in mind? Um, yes. So uh, I'm going to take an example. I, it's been actually, people didn't comment so much on it, but they didn't realize what it means. So you know that Apple with their new chips, uh, the M1 chips and M2 chips, they can mm -hmm. actually run mobile apps onto your desktop. Yep. And I don't know if you realize as well, but Microsoft is moving a lot of their hardware into a, a more mo mobile and tablet approach. And they are redesigning Microsoft as well in, in Windows into ways that they can support um, mobile application, right, developed for Windows. So what I see a lot at the moment, and, and I'm not a Nostradamus, I don't know if you know a Nostradamus, but I'm not uh, like a vision, I'm not a visionary of future. I don't dream of the future and the rest, but I, I recognize certain sign of technologies, right? 
the consumer world is getting faster and faster and we are selling more and more mobiles and more and more application uh, uh, hardware that basically allow you to do things faster and access it wherever you want, right? Which means that you need to have hardware to support this. And this is why our big corporation like Apple, Microsoft, Google are all going that way. It's because they realize as well that even on desktop, certain of the application that people are using on mobile, they're using it more on mobile and they would actually use it as much on, on their desktop, but they end up actually having their mobile I, I don't know you, but my mobile is just just right there. And sometimes to go faster, I go on my mobile. Why? Because it's more precise and more dedicated. And you see that with the trend in those large company onto the technology that they, they, they are moving, but also onto the, the kind of emphasis they are doing. It's subtle. You need to watch it over years, right? And it started back in 2020 when we moved to a more integrated uh, ecosystem, right? Uh, an, an experience that is all connected. Google is a perfect example of that. Have you ever, so I don't know if you use Google, but if you use Google and you go to the app, especially my, my business, if you're a Google, Google business, you go to the app and you go to the, the button of apps, the way Google build its ecosystem is not one software. It's tons and tons of little apps that are part of the work of, of the work. And the, the things that Google do, does extremely well is that they build something, they try it, and if after a few years, no one actually using it, they actually just kill it. Right. They've killed many things lately. Right. Many things that, uh, like Google Plus, you don't work, they killed it. Yeah. They killed things for um, uh, collaboration as well uh, that were out, outdated. And I'm pretty sure they're gonna kill way more in a few years. And what, the, what those large corporations are, do, are doing are also buying small companies that are very good at doing one specific, specific things. And I, I evolved in the world of trading. Bloomberg is a very great example of everybody who knows Bloomberg, they know it's big, but actually it's actually building, they build one terminal and it's an interface, but it's the connectors to many, many small things and many, many data sources everywhere, right? And more and more you'll see this. You'll see actually uh, a bump into add-ons for other products, for example, Lately, I've, I've seen many, many of my uh, contacts on LinkedIn and then people in my network building add-ons for Googles and selling it, right? Because the business model changed as well, right? People don't want to buy for long-term anymore, right? They want to buy short-term and then change quickly if they are not happy anymore. And that's the same in business. You know, I, when I used to work in Schlumberger, we used to make contracts. We made a contract with a company in 2010 no, 11, we signed it with a company for 20 years. Today, you say to a company, I want a contract for 20 years. They look at you with big eyes and say, what? It's like, you're crazy. You know, <laughs> I want two years, you know, maximum or three years, but five, 20, 10 years, because the cost of implementation is very high. So one of the things as well we are going to see and we are seeing is that most, most and more people want an easy way of integrating into their environment. This is why integration is important. If you don't integrate in your, in, into an ecosystem, you're going to die on, it, you're on your own. If you are just a niche and you are just like, you're not connected to anything, you're going to die. You see it a lot actually with product management tools. For example, uh, the best, you, you know, uh, I know, I'm pretty sure, I don't know if you know that, but one of the best tools of project management I've known is one of the, I've used in Shomoji, which was Azure DevOps. It had everything. You can customize everything, right? When I left, I had to learn Atlassian and Jira, but then, okay, fine. It was fine, but still to convert some, I wanted something even simpler, more niche because I didn't need the whole bells and whistles, but connected well. So I took Clubhouse and then when you look at the integration of all these tools, they integrate more and more with the design tools. So things are more streamlined. They integrate more with the project management tool, with the, develop, the, de the deployment tools and so forth. The reality is that uh, if you try to build one single tool that does everything like an operating system, it's not gonna work, right? Most of the companies nowadays, and especially those large companies, they are seeking to have more flexibility. I don't have, the, I don't know what's 2030 is going to happen, but you know, the COVID showed us a lot of things. 
the COVID episode, Kepler is all full remote. We don't have, we have offices, right? And people can go and rent an office, but everybody works from home. One thing we had to learn is, well, we do more visual co virtual calls, so let's record them so we can actually do something out, uh, something else with it and actually always come back. All of those tools basically have changed because of what happened over the last couple of years. Product management has changed as well, by the way, because you know when people say we have to be agile and they actually are not, and they don't actually know, know what agile means beyond, oh, it's a scrum, it's a scrum meeting. They actually had to learn to communicate differently and more efficiently so the developers that they are not sitting beside them, are not sitting with them anymore, can understand what they do. It forced product management, the COVID forced product management to step up our game. And for that, we needed tools different than what we had, right? So this is basically the trends I see. And this is why I say, you are gonna see more and more happening into this B2B world, also in B2C where you are gonna have more and more niche things that basically ramp up. And by the way, there is also another thing happening in, you know, part, being part of um, uh, various teams and, and mentoring for startups and, and, and venture capital, I see it as well. There is a bubble around funding. funding. There is a lot of funding happening for a lot of startups at the moment. Everyone had, that has an idea, there is money for it. You know, you have an idea, go and get money. Even if you fail, right? Because those venture capital, they, they know that you have to invest more to basically get uh, to, 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 to get an outcome, right? Uh, to get something out of it. And this is basically what, what I've seen is that it, it doesn't really matter if you can't find a, the concept anymore. Sometimes taking an old concept, but making it better actually is more successful than trying to build something brand new. You know the best. You know the best tool in the world. The one tool that will never die, right, are actually the tools that Microsoft created. They didn't create it. They used to have a table on the paper, Excel. You know, the concept of it will never die because it's everywhere now. It's a great product. You can do hell a lot with uh, with Excel. And trust me, you have people that really, really love Excel. You know, Excel. Well, PowerPoint is different. You know, PowerPoint is the enemy of, of a great product because most people take what they see in their product and paste it in PowerPoint. And a great product that uh, where uh, you someone can present something on the product and not on PowerPoint, you are winner, man. But Excel and Word are the two products that the concept shows that you can't get smaller. You know, Google took Excel and said, I'm going to take the 80% of the things that people really do in Excel and do it into a web, and that would be good enough for most people. But that's, that's not a lot of Excel. That's a tiny bit, but it's good enough for, for the consumers. There's no need to have bells and whistles. But again, Excel nowadays is not so much, a, it's just a, it's part of your life. It's probably the most, the most used software in the world. So does that, 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 that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, sure, it that, does. A lot, Clark. Oh, You're welcome. Okay. Go ahead. No, no. I think the question I did. I answered the question, right? Yeah, exactly. I think just a comment from me. Um, I think you share a lot about those very big boys uh, who have a platform who are able to build their ecosystem. But for us, maybe mm -hmm. for a lot of the B two B cases is figuring out how do you integrate into the bigger ecosystem that's in the business world yes. so you can be in yeah. Exactly. And that's a challenge, but to be honest, they're opening up more and more. We just have to be cautious on to um, the people we are building it to. You know, we have to be uh, ethical and we have to be sustainable. So we make sure that uh, we respect the people we build it to and don't forget about them. Yep, thank you. Go ahead, Amanda. You're yes. welcome. So you mentioned about uh, good concepts never die, right? But there are yeah. always disruptions from your mm. competitors. And all these rhythms of uh, product life cycle or whatever you call it um, would 
actually be changed uh, and how you define each phase would be different as well. And maybe some companies would be stuck at particular phase where some others would be much more like doing another thing already like after three years. So how do you see like uh, in terms of acquiring or retaining talents, um, mm. how do you communicate like this kind of uh, changes, like how, uh, uh, and, and which phase your company is in? And uh, it's always difficult to have a crystal, crystal ball and project what your company is going to face in front of all the competitions out there, right? So uh, what, what are the tips to, to tell to your potential uh, employees that will so, join your company? Um, to be honest, for me, it's, uh, it's based on communication. You have to be transparent. You know, you have to be transparent in your team. Yeah, you do not have a crystal ball. You have your gut feelings, but you know, don't, don't underestimate the knowledge of your team. And you can't, in a company, you need to be very clear, even if you're in the top management, the executive teams or the, 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 the leadership team of the teams that you do not have all the answers, but maybe some of the people in the company have. And you need to be able to come to have this culture of, sharing and being very open about something and just say okay i've seen those trends you know what about them and 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 allow the company and the people to question your decision in a very safe environment it's about communication you know i've worked in a large company where everything was top down and frankly sometimes you wonder why this decision was taken it's not actually what we see and it's not what the customer needs sometimes you know that the customer don't know what they need so you have to make it along but it doesn't make you feel empowered it doesn't make you feel part of the decision and it doesn't make you actually uh, work harder for this so the most important is to make sure that there is a communication and after that there is no silver bullet frankly amanda you have to be listening listening, listening, and being able to take a hard decision is also the second thing is there's no point also spending six months trying to analyze the market because the, the, the reality is that you have to try, show it to the market and test it and then see if there is something because nowadays trying to analyze a market that changed in less than six months, it always changed every six months. I mean, it's, in, it's impossible to predict. You have to try. You just have to get your hands on and build something, try, fail, move on. It's okay. At least you know, you know, uh, you know what um, Edison said is when they, they, he un invented the bulb, you know, it's like, yeah, I tried 3000 times, but I, it was not a failure. I've learned how to not do a, how to 3000 ways to not do a bulb, light bulb. It'll be the same way. Yeah, you have to be honest, communicate, and just keep trying. There is no silver bullet, frankly. Yeah, in the B2B world, there are a lot of all these huge enterprises and big mm. elephant companies, right? And it's really hard for us to like uh, advocate for a cultural shift to like uh, make make sure they embrace changes and uh, empower the team to do experiments and try the failures. What, what are your tips to convince the management uh, to, to, to- So you need to be, so there is two ways. There is a way that I tried as well, which is basically make sure that you, you are very clear on your business case because it's business to business, you have to have a business case, but you don't need to have like 300 slides for it and understand it. But make sure that they understand the needs, the outcome you are trying to solve. You know? It's a discussion, you know, it's, a, it's a discussion and it's facts. You need to bring facts, either via metrics or via feedback, direct feedback. 
the other thing is some is uh, is something I've learned in Schlumberger. Uh and pardon Walt Disney or whoever worked in big corporation at the moment. Sometimes it's easier to uh, to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Because let me tell you something: if you try and fail and they are not aware of it, no, nothing happened. If you try and fail and they are aware of it, you say, oh, "Look, we had to try because we had this feedback." And frankly, they are not going to blame you because you are trying to build a product. But if you try and succeed, okay, you can forget the recognition. You are never going to say, okay, she tried that as the best, but at least the idea has moved on. The second thing is one thing that one of my mentor of the time taught me was um, you don't need to try to uh, do it uh, all and try to make all the team succeed focus on to some individuals in some part of the team, make them work well and succeed. And then the rest are going to follow and they're going to watch how they are doing and they're going to start to do the same. And without you realizing it, you've actually started a chain of, of a reaction chain that's basically going to grow over the team. And the culture, a, something like a culture of a company is not something set in stone. It's evolving all the time. It's moving. So you need to have this organic growth and let it grow as well, right? And as much as people say, you know, yeah, we listen, big corporation, the rest, I've done it enough to say, look, sometimes you can do as much politics and you can carry on doing as much politics you want. Sometimes you just have to do the work. And it's easier, again, pardon me, but it's easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. When you know it's right and you know why it's right, because you can justify it. And that's, that's what you say. That comes with maturity. I see. Yeah, that's a great Good. tip, actually. Yeah. Uh, anyone else have questions for Clark? If not, I will ask one more question. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned about uh, like nowadays the products are more decentralized, even in the B2B world, yeah. right? Like they no longer committed to a 20 year contract and mm. uh, to, to get on a huge system and to take yeah. on a lot of risk. How do you convince the people who used to believe that Ah, oh, you have a huge customer base because your system is well developed, is well mature, and have a lot of success stories and reference clients, and mm. they are well thought. Uh, whereas compared to another extreme where you have all these smaller components that integrate with each other and um, that these are not something that many B two B companies are used to, and how would you advocate those trends and uh, uh, and the benefits of uh, having that uh, paradigm shift? So this paradigm shift is going to happen not in one day. It's going to happen by loop. So it's going to. So what happens now is that in downturns, in period of downturns, people are going to basically spend more money uh, in, in build, take the tools that they need. And then they're going to come back to integration, then they're going to come back and then slowly, as the technology evolves, things evolve. The, the best way, and I've done it multiple times when I was in Schlumberger monthly, is um, in a bit right, with Kepler and, and Techstars, but it's to make sure that people and your customers understand their value chain. Draw them, draw the value chain with them. You know, what is the value chain and why are they doing what they are doing at each step? It's, it looks like a tube way, a tube, a tube map, you know, uh, a subway map. If you draw them, if you draw with them this value chain, then you get way more out of it. And you basically make sure that uh, you can explain them where you fit in this value chain and then how they can be more efficient in their, in their outcome. 
you know, uh, in a lot of the coaching I do at the moment, it's about really, um, you know, just making sure that people understand their value chain. You know, it's what's the value they bring and their differentiator within the biggest, uh, the bigger part of the ecosystem. And if you sit down and explain that to the people, they, they actually have like big eyes and it's like, oh yeah, I didn't think of this like this. And you'd be surprised how often that happens where company startups or large corporation um, basically um, realize that. And let's be honest, right? Large corporation, they don't have all the solutions. They need smaller companies and they need smaller product as well. And in their tech stack and software stack, they, that's what they have. So one of the key thing is to make sure that people understand in the company wide that that's the value that they're gonna get with that product or another. And sometimes, by the way, just to be clear, you have to take a product for only a short period of time because you need a, you have a specific need and that product is good for that specific need. And this is why you have to be a bit more flexible. But the key things also to, to take away from, from our discussion is that, yes, the technology world and the product world are evolving, but the skill set that are required as well evolves, not only uh, as you as an individual, but it evolves based on the need of the product. So to be, to be a successful product manager, you need to understand where are your strengths and your weaknesses, and then start to apply them into uh, basically the, uh, find the right product where they can be used. If you find the right fit, then you are gonna be very successful. If your skills don't fit the maturity of the product, you are gonna be frustrated and you're not gonna deliver as much. Right. And it's the same in business when you try to sell a product to a company. If you don't understand what the company needs because you don't know the value chain, then your product is not gonna fit in this value chain. See my point? Yeah, that's really well said because a lot of uh, companies or they claim themselves as solution providers, right? But they don't mm. really want to listen to their customers of what business problems they're having or they're encountering and they're always just wanting to sell you solutions to mm -hmm. some unknown problems, which is uh, a little bit yeah. weird. Well, you know, those companies will live for very sh short attention. You know, it's just like, you, you, you need to focus. I had, uh, we have a, a very cool CFO in Kepler that started not so long time ago, who said to me once, I mean, we were in a meeting and said, why are we focusing on the wrong, on, on the wrong competitors? No. Like those small companies, uh, frankly, and he's right, and and I will see as well. Um, basically, he said the same, and I, I'm also of the opinion. And actually, everybody, it's logical, you know. It's when you have those companies trying their hard and do a lot of noise, and they are very pr present in the in in their marketing and all. It's all noise. If they can't actually turn and take business out of of your business, then why do you focus on them? Why do you try to be a, a, a small kid when you know what your users want? Focus on your users. Focus on the demand of your users. And let everybody else just do what they, were, what they want. Keep an eye on them. You know, just keep them at, at arm length. But don't focus on to trying to do the same or trying to fight them. Because then you're going to lose yourself. And you can't base your strategy of a product onto all those small companies that, or small products that are uh, rising. You have to be very hard and, and conscious and take a decision and stick with it. Be flexible in the way that your mind actually diverge. But if your concept, if you believe in your concept and you have proven those concepts right, and principle or distinctives, then you go with it. You know? Yeah, the persistence, right? Uh, the persistence, yeah. you know, the reliant, the resilient politician, the resilient, uh, resilience is very key. Great. Very good. Thanks so much for your sharing tonight, uh, Clark, at your afternoon. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.
So uh, I wish you all. Uh, yeah. I wish you all a very good evening and a good night um, for the the, the Hong Kong-based uh, person or Asia, and for the the, the others that are online and the rest. Uh, thank you very much for watching and uh, and having me. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for teaching us a lot of uh, great <laughs> insights from your experience. Um, just for the audience, we we are actually celebrating World Brother Day today. So uh, Hong Kong is ahead of many other countries and cities in the world uh, in terms of time zone. I, I, uh, yeah, so you can actually still watch a lot of uh, Brother Tang sharings to, uh, of other cities today uh, by going to the Mind the Product uh, website and you can see a list of cities participating in this World Product Day. So uh, I believe you will have a very fruitful learning journey uh, and just uh, keep an eye on our uh, social media where we will post uh, new updates of uh, upcoming events. And if you are open to volunteer uh, your topics or you have a good connection of speakers to come to speak to us and uh, we want to grow the community together. Okay, so yeah, that's for tonight. Thanks so much everyone for participating. So thank you. Have a nice evening. Good luck. Bye. Good day to you, Clark, and good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, my dear.